Okay, so our final presenter is Cynthia DiMartino from California Lutheran University. She's going to discuss findings from a comparison of blended and traditional format courses in a small liberal arts setting, analyzed using a communities of inquiry approach. Um, thank you again. Cynthia DiMartino, I also have my colleague Jean Sandlin here. She's one of the professors who taught um, these one of these courses, several sections of these courses. So if you have questions um, for either of us, we're both here. Um, so a little background, you might be familiar with the debate of uh, Clark versus Cosma. Um, this is in the media literature. Clark suggests that there's no significant difference in learning dependent on the medium. And this is because of what he calls replaceability. So for example, I can make a very fancy video of a dragonfly and zooming into the wing. Um, but I could also just draw it up on the board, right? It's the teaching tactic of highlighting things. It is not the fact that it's on a video. Um, and this has been, uh, this has a lot of evidence if you look at the online versus traditional classrooms. It doesn't look like uh, the, medium, the medium affects the message at all, right? Like learning. Cosma, on the other hand, but there would be significant differences. If not now, this argument started in the 80s, than in the future. <laughs> and the argument for this was the affordances of the medium. So affordances is just a fancy way of saying what we can use something for, right? I can sit in a chair, it's intended use, or I can stand on it, or change a light bulb, or I can throw it at somebody, right? <laughs> How I choose to use it, it's not necessarily what it was built for. Um, and this has been borne out more recently in uh, meta-analyses of blended. So when we're comparing blended studies, versus online or blended versus traditional in large meta-analyses, now we're finding differences. But the problem is, and this has been brought up several times already, these are for large universities. 300 students packed into a classroom. Is this appropriate? Is, does this still apply in a small liberal arts setting? Um, to add on to that, I wanted to, and we wanted to, expand the literature too in the theoretical direction. I believe very firmly that it's important to have theories to graph these things onto so that we can continue to build on the knowledge. Um, community of inquiry was one of the better tested theories. That is to say it has a handful of studies using it when looking at blended. It is very new and nothing is really um, tested specifically in the blended environment. There's a lot of one-off studies, but this is one of the few theories that has been looked at several times in blended. If you know of any others, please let me know. <laughs> <laughs> the literature is massive and there's all these different, I come from a communications, a more of a media background. Um, so there's, you know, I'm sure there's literature out there that I'm not aware of. Um, and so this theory basically says that there are three um, areas that contribute to that educational experience and that why it's appropriate for blended is because blended really enables you to do these things. And this has also been a common theme of this conference. You've got social presence where the faculty is cultivating a community, right? And we know that there are certain tools where students can collaborate online asynchronously, asynchronously to form more of a cohesive um, community. We've got cognitive presence, so moving from the lower to the higher levels of thinking. That's something that's been stressed a lot, right? We want to get away from just them remembering and understanding. We want them to get at those higher levels. Um, and if by automating those lower levels, we can approach these things in the classroom more. And um, teaching presence. So this is kind of like the management of the course, which we know technology can either help or harm. Right? So it can make the course easier to manage, it can um, facilitate it, or it can be a complete nightmare and crash the course. Um, so hopefully that whatever technology we're using is helping it. Okay, so the design of the study, we have five faculty um, teaching at least two sections. So one blended and one traditional. Because of course sizes and enrollment issues, we actually have like Jean taught four sections. <laughs> Two traditional, two blended, um, uh, another uh, faculty taught uh, two blended, one traditional. We tried to keep them all at the same time, again, because of um, issues of enrollment and things like that, you can't have control. We randomly assigned students into the conditions. So, wow. so yes, 
know, it was very impressive. Um, and they were not super happy about that in those cases. Um, but I just felt like it was really important. I mean, you have to control for this stuff. If the student can self-select a blended course, we know they are probably going to do better in that course. So I tortured these poor students. I literally <laughs> signed them. I hope your evals are okay. <laughs> yeah, yes, I went in and I introduced the whole study. So hopefully we tried to keep it kind of separate so it looked like it, I'm the principal investigator and that was another control too. Um, the person analyzing the data also did not teach these courses. So we're trying to um, have some controls in this study. Um, because a lot of the other studies I saw too with the liberal arts weren't, you know, necessarily the most rigorous design. Often the principal investigator was the instructor of the course and it was a one-off case study. So it's like um, very valuable, very valuable information, but I was looking at kind of the um, more rigorous blended, my favorite blended drink. Right? Um, <laughs> it's a 50-50 blend, which means that we were actually taking 50% of the class time and replacing it with like, that face-to-face -face class time, replacing it with online. Uh, primarily pre-recorded lectures. Yeah, I'm interested in like this, you know, is the actual medium what is making any difference? The fact that the kids can rewind and replay, is that actually helping those lower levels of learning or is it the exact same if they were in the classroom? Or is it worse than in the classroom, especially in a small classroom where the, you know, professor can ask questions and they can ask questions. Um, we tried to have a balance between consistency. Oh, do you have another question? Just a quick clarification. Yeah. That 50% of class time was definitely a reduction of class time? It was a reduction of class time. So, um, and that's not necessarily a model that the community, our, our liberal arts community is interested in at all, um, but they're already doing some flipped classrooms with augmentation, you know, so I wanted to kind of take it a step beyond that and see if this was an appropriate model. We already know that if you flip a classroom and you do more active learning, and that's gonna, that's gonna improve things, especially if you do it well. Students are doing those high level stuff in the class, we know that works. Um, the question is, does this work? If they're doing active learning in the traditional section as well as the blended section. <coughs> um, but the consistency was not between, it was not among the faculty themselves, it was within. So we tried to match up as best we could the traditional and the blended section. But the instructors themselves had a lot of autonomy on how these classes wanted to look. And because we went through different disciplines, Jean teaches a communication class, we had two bio classes, we had a philosophy class, and we had a statistics class. So we had this big, uh, fairly large diversity, so we couldn't say like everyone's got to have this many quizzes. It just wouldn't make sense in a philosophy class. We didn't have any quizzes. It was all a discussion. Um, so we were trying to balance it, and that makes it, I think, more realistic, too, because you're never going to be able to get faculty in a small little rocks to follow one design, right? <laughs> never going to happen. Okay, our research questions slash hypotheses. Um, grade will differ significantly, so that was my, um, that was what I was really concerned with. Um, I wanted to see student learning outcomes, so based on the student learning outcomes, assignments were created. I wanted to see grades on the assignments. Um, I don't really care about the students' opinions of it. I asked them one question about that, mostly because the other faculty made me. <laughs> <laughs> and I wanted to see if community inquiry was, if there was a difference on the scale, that's a validated scale. Another reason I like that theory. Um, and if that differed, and if it mediated the difference, if there was any. The results were wildly insignificant. So they <laughs> grades for the fall classes. We didn't have time to input the spring grades considering they're due next week. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 so we're not there yet. But um, so you can see um, in the, uh, the stats now, this is the top is the traditional, bottom is the blended. Um, there's some differences, especially in the stats course and the bio course, maybe with a little variance. You know, there, there was um, one is student in each that maybe got the, the F and in the blended section didn't, but that is also not significant. You can see that is actually flipped in the philosophy class. Um, although he graded them, he has his own very different grading scheme too. So he grades things, his A is from like an 85. 
So again, a lot of autonomy to make it more realistic, but then my data, <laughs> you know. Those philosophers. Yeah, those philosophers. Yeah, that's a lot of wanting, to, wanting to rationalize things. So, um, but even dropping this out, there's no significant difference in the variance between the stats and the bio. As you can see, there's, you know, the curves look a little different, but there's across the board um, nothing significant. There's no significant and you can even see, too, uh, that the mean was slightly higher in the traditional class. Mm. Uh, but that's not a significant difference. Again, OK. And now um, uh, the community of inquiry and some of the control questions. Um, so over here, you see the one and the two is the means. So we asked, how many hours of homework did you do? So one of the meta-analyses thought that maybe a lot of the difference, or they, did, they ran a test. Um, and they found that time on task mediated this. So we know if we give the students a lot more homework, a lot more stuff to do, they're going to have different, you know, they're going to learn a little bit more, right? If we did a class and a half, that's another reason why we made sure to actually limit face time. Because if you give them a class and a half, not only are your evals really going to suck, but they're also spending so much time on this stuff that, yeah, we would expect it to be better. Um, <laughs> This is the soft question they made me add. How much did you learn? Um, and then how many video lectures? So control, we wanted to see, like, make sure the students who were in the traditional section didn't get a hold of those video lectures. It was on a login. But some of those kids are crafty. There were some in the traditional section that got a hold <laughs> of those video lectures. So they must have stolen their roommate's login or their roommate must have shared it. But at least it was only one or two, as you can see. That was the only thing that was significantly different. So you can see the means um, for that question 37, right? For the traditional section, it was very few students had gotten access to those lectures. Um, and for the um, blended, they all had. Um, although they hadn't watched them all either, that was another reason to have that control question. Um, and there was no significant difference between the um, creative inquiry um, uh, uh, teaching, social, or cognitive um, elements. So all of these things, and in fact, again, the negative means that the traditional was higher. So these are not significant differences, but you know, just visually, and these are actually for the entire study. This is including the spring data, because uh, we were able to enter that in. Although we'll probably drop some questions and play with it, you know, massage the data a little bit and see what happens. Um, but as of right now, we're thinking there is no significant difference. So conclusions, the good on that is if our faculty want to use this, great. We can support them. We can say it's not going to hurt your students, right? If you can do it, um, we'll, we'll help you. So I'm in the Center of Teaching and Learning, so we'll help you create these and build them in a way that's logical and appropriate for your course. Um, also properly labeled so students can self-select. Yeah, we, won't, we won't be back to them anymore. Um, also, I think another takeaway is that I'm guessing we probably already do all these things in the small liberal arts. Because you've only got 20 students, we're already building a sense of community. We're already trying to go at those higher levels, especially the faculty who volunteered for this study. Um, so I think, or well, we kind of chose them. We shoehorned some of them into coming into it. So the, the faculty didn't necessarily self-select. We approached them to get a variety of technologically savvy faculty and also a diversity. But the fact that they still had to say yes you know, and we're a small liberal arts institution that really puts a, a high premium on student engagement, student-centered learning. Um, so I'm thinking that we already do all these things, and that's why it's not necessarily significant. It also could be that Quark is right, that it really doesn't matter. It's really the techniques we use, and this is just about making us more efficient, you know, so that we can use those things that we know really matter. That's it. Thank you.